Hi. In our last video, I promised that we would return with a series of short, closely spaced videos that broke down the subsystems of this turbojet project to show you how we built it. This would allow you to reproduce what we did or take some of these ideas for your own projects. Now, if you're interested in the actual turbojet itself, we cover the design, the operation, the construction in a previous set of videos that you can take a look at. But once you've built the jet engine, you've got to mount it, and there are some challenges there. Because the jet engine gets quite hot, and because it involves substantial forces as well as flammable liquids, I would highly recommend that whatever structure you put it on, it's going to be made out of metal. The other thing that you've got to think about is the dimensions. I don't like to work on projects where I have to get down on my knees or I'm bending over all the time, and so I like to build something tall enough that it's easy for me to work with. You can make a judgment yourself, but consider ease of operation in terms of the height. Another thing I would strongly recommend is build it substantially larger than you think you need. You see the small jet engine and the large stand? The reason for that is once you build the engine, you're going to want to mess around with it. And just like we showed in the last video, because of the oversized stand, it was easy for us to put the afterburner on this engine without modifying the stand. If you remember the very large turbocharger that I had on the table when I was discussing the afterburner, that turbocharger is going to allow us to build a compound turbocharged jet engine essentially two-stage compression, and that turbocharger will fit on this larger stand, as will the turboshaft project that we'll get into later this year where we turn the hot gases into mechanical output. Build it big, and then you don't have to build it again. Now, something that you may notice here is this frame structure. If you've watched some of our videos, I rely on this a lot. This is from a company called 8020. That's the actual name of the company, and they make extruded aluminum rails as well as components that fit together sort of like a big boy version of an erector set. Very convenient and I'll get into that in just a second. Once you've built the rib structure or the frame, a nice way to mount the jet engine is to put some flat panels of relatively thick aluminum on the top. Cut them to the outer dimensions of the stand, in this case 24 inches by 30 inches or 60 centimeters by 75 centimeters, and about a 5 millimeter thickness or 3 sixteenths is a good thickness. Aluminum is easy to work with and it's physically strong enough that we can bolt all of our components to the tabletop. It's not just a cover, it's actually a structural element. I carried that through to the bottom of this stand. As you see on the bottom here, I cut a second panel, equal thickness, and just cut out little corners to allow this to be slid in and bolted down, just like the top panel. This serves a couple of purposes. One is it strengthens up the frame so that we're not standing on these spindly little legs. In addition, we can put fuel and supplies down on the stand, makes things nice and neat. But more importantly, depending on how you're going to be operating this thing, the jet engine makes a substantial amount of thrust at the top end. And if you build it tall, like I did, it would have a tendency to tip. Having a plate down there would allow you, if you chose to do it this way, to put a couple of bags of sand or some gravel or something at the bottom that heavily weight this down and prevents tipping. Now, I decided not to do it that way. I decided to use a little different method. And if you look at the corner of these frames, there's four hard points that we bolted to the corners. And using some extra leftover sailing equipment, but you can get stuff from hard, hardware stores, little clips, I'm actually able to clip the, this cable to the corners and then run out in our gravel driveway with a hammer and a stake. And I can actually run these cables out there to oppose the tipping forces. Two different ways to accomplish the same sort of result. Now, you might notice that the middle table is not made out of aluminum. It's epoxy-coated MDF. And the fancy technical reason for doing this is I just ran out of aluminum. Uh, it works. I've used it for a couple of years. There's no problem with it. But if you were doing this, and if I had enough aluminum at the time, I would have also made this out of aluminum. But it works. 
you can bend the rules a little bit. In any case, that's the reason for the different colored stand over here. Now, one of the challenges of mounting the actual jet engine is because, first of all, it gets quite hot. Second of all, its shape is kind of irregular. You've got cylindrical and spiral shapes. I came up with a pretty decent way to mount this so that it's secure and it's also tolerant of the high temperatures. If you look around here to the back of this stand, you'll see a little square steel tube. This has to be steel, not aluminum, because it's going to be in contact with a hot engine and aluminum doesn't tolerate heat quite as well. And what I did is I just machined a little trough in the square tube that is deep enough that allows me to place a cylindrical shape on here and it rests on the edges. This provides a nice non-tip secure contact point to support the cylindrical shape. And if you then notice on the sides, I drilled a hole, squared them up with a file in order to be able to get a little bar that is a hole drilled in the middle of it. And that is then used to clamp with a screw and a nut underneath. And you can locate the support point at any point that you want on the stand. It's arbitrary and it's flexible. You can move it around by just drilling a different hole. The other advantage of this is because the tube only contacts at these very fine, thin lines, there's very little thermal contact. And so therefore, even though the end gets very hot, during operation I can put my finger at the bottom surface here and it becomes noticeably warm but transfers very little heat to the underlying plate. This is cheap, easy, and very flexible. It's a nice way to mount this. Now once you've located where the jet engine is and you know where you're going to be putting this thing permanently, You'll then mark where you're going to have the feed-throughs. You, you're going to have uh, a turbine inlet temperature gauge, a pressure gauge, oil feed lines, potentially water feed lines. Mark them, drill holes to allow the tubing to go through. And then a nice feature is to use what's called a grommet. Now, almost everybody probably knows what a grommet is, but, but for the few of you that don't, these are simply rubber peanut-shaped structures that have a thin inner diameter and then two flanges at the ends. This allows you to squish the rubber into an oversized hole and the flanges keep it from popping out. This provides a nice soft surface so that if you have lines like the fuel line or the oil line that go through here that aren't covered in stainless steel, they're not going to abrade. It's kind of a nice touch. Now as I explained earlier on, you don't want this thing to tip and one thing that helps us to prevent this from tipping is I decided not to mount this on wheels. But this thing as it stands right now weighs about 200 pounds and because I used leveling pads to put this down to give me a nice secure level contact with the floor, this thing would be a bear to move around. When we're done with our experiments, you want to push it aside, get your truck in here, this would be a hassle to move. You could put wheels with locks on them, pretty good too. The option I decided to use was once I had these hard points in here, and we do have an engine lift out here, what I simply did is fabricated a little wooden load spreader, you can see this like this, hanging from the engine lift with four chains and clips on the end of the chains. These allow me to connect the top of the jet engine at four points and then hoist it up. Once I've lifted the jet engine up, then I can slide that little wooden cart that you see underneath it and get it up in the air enough that I can then settle it down. I can do this all by myself. I don't need a bunch of burly guys to help me. And then I can roll it around. It seems more complicated than just having wheels, but the other advantage of this is this engine lift will go quite high. So I can lift the jet engine a foot and a half up in the air and we can actually get one of our trailers in here if I want to take this jet engine to a school or a place where I'm going to demonstrate it or down to my son's warehouse. It's a lot easier to move than again trying to lug this thing on the back of a trailer. Different options. You can do it however you like. What I'd like to do now though is review with you a little bit about this stuff. It's really great and I'd highly recommend using it. Let's go in. Now, I know this is going to sound like a sales pitch. I'm not working for the company, but I really love this stuff, and I think it's worth sharing with you some of the insights that I've learned over the years with using this material. The this, this sort of central component of the 8020 uh, products are these extruded 
aluminum beams. They come in a variety of different sizes. You can get them as small as 15 millimeter cross section all the way up to monsters that are 150 by 150 millimeters, six inch by six inch. Big enough that you could literally build a house from this stuff. And it would be kind of interesting to build a building. I've never seen anybody do that. They come in both metric as well as imperial. They come clear anodized, like you can see these here, as well as black anodized. And what makes them so useful is the fact that they come with a huge number, variety, of different types of interface components that you can use to connect them. You've got gussets like these, you have straight bars like these, they come double wide, three times longer, half this length, they have 45 degree angle brackets, articulating angle brackets, sliders, shelf supports. If you can think of some way to connect these things, odds are they've already got it in their product line. And what makes it easy to work with is you don't have to machine anything. And everything is held together with these unusual little flat nuts and button head cap screws that will slide into these grooves that have been formed in the end of the beam that allow them to slide in place and then be tightened down. And they're very easy to put on. If you take a look at this little gusset that I have here, you just slide the components in like this, tighten them down, lock them down, and then when you're done, you release it. They're strong. They're actually stronger than welding because when you weld two components together, the distance between the weld and the load access is very, very short, so there's a lot of stress. But when you have these large distances between the components, you develop a lot of strength. So this is both stiffer and stronger than welding, and like I said, it's removable. It's also relatively inexpensive and kind of in an unusual way. The beams themselves are not much more expensive than an equal weight of aluminum and just a solid beam, which is kind of unusual. Where the, the price or the cost adds up is in these side components here. This costs about six bucks. These each cost about 15 bucks, and you can see they would start to add up. But the point is, just like clamps and tools and anything that you've got around your shop, once you've bought them, they're good forever. And so you can build up an inventory of these things to build a wide variety of projects. And when you're done with the project, you're tired with, of what you're doing with it at the present time, take everything apart and you can build something else. It doesn't cost you anything. Over here, I've built a structure like this. This is a tracking tripod or mount for a tracking solar cell system that we're going to be demonstrating in a few months. This, if you remember, is the table that we used to support the air conditioner for our computer overclocking experiment. And if you look over there in that side of the room, you might recognize that optical table that I built a few years ago to support our pulsed dye laser at the top. There's a lot of stuff that you can do with these things and they're very easy to work with. Another little interesting feature is if you look in the end, you can see those little holes that are extruded in the uh, end of the rod. Those things just happen to be drilled to the right diameter that you can directly tap them with a 5 16 inch thread. That's how I mounted the lifting eyes that I had out there on the cart. And it's also how I was able to put these leveling pads down on the bottom of this right here. So except for a tap, there's no machining that you have to do. So it's, it's really interesting stuff. Each of the components come with their own set of screws and bolts. So you've got a great setup. And they've thought of little things. Like for example, if I built something like this and say I wanted to mount a, a shelf or something on the side of it, and I was gonna put this component on, it's like, uh-oh, what do I do? Because I can't get the nut in, I would have to disassemble it. They make these little spring tab nuts that you can actually insert between already fixtured items like this. You just square them up to get the ridges lined up in the slot like that and then you can just bolt into them whenever you're uh, wherever you want them to be and then when you're done you can just pop these things out remove them and at a dollar a piece it's not a big deal this is great stuff and i really recommend you take a look at the website because they have some really good ideas for things that you can build and these things are used all over the world you'll see them at stanford mit all over european labs it's been around for a long time it's well respected a very good company and so 
that's what we're going to be covering or using in a lot of our future projects. Next video is going to cover the fuel system. How do we get the juice inside of the engine to get it to burn? I'll see you soon.